Thanks for joining me today. Uh, I'm Michael Wong. I'm a board certified veterinary neurologist at Southeast Veterinary Neurology. Uh, I we work primarily in our Miami office, but we've got offices in Boynton Beach and in Jupiter. Uh, today we're going to be talking about seizures, and on, on the next screen I'm going to introduce you to a puppy named Leia. She's a, a four-year-old terrier. You know, she's the, the center of this family. They've had her since she was a puppy. She's the kind of dog that, you know, gets gets toenails painted and goes in strollers and goes on, on vacation uh, with the family. They've, she's been there with some of the uh, good times and, and some of the, <coughs> excuse me, tougher times. Um, you could call her kind of the, the youngest daughter in the family. I'm going to do my best just to keep my mouth shut um, and, and, and let you guys listen here. Oh, don't make it here. I'm too funny. Too funny. <laughs> I don't understand why she did. You guys fed her the pill. Yeah. Why you Oh no! Oh <laughs> So th th this video is really, really powerful to me. I, I mean, it's you know a, a glimpse into what people are seeing at, at home. You know, as, as veterinarians, we kind of see these patients in the hospital, and uh, sometimes it's easy to forget just how distressing, uh, how scary these episodes are for for these families. Um, you can just hear it in, in these in these girls' voices. You know, they don't know what to do. They've never seen something like this. They just feel absolutely health, helpless. And and most of us would never want a pet or a family to go through anything like this. But when it comes down to it, seizures are the number one neurological condition in dogs. Um, thousands upon thousands of families go through this. And as veterinarians, we have the opportunity to to make a huge difference in the lives of these pets and these people. And and hopefully today by by learning a little bit more about diagnosis and treatment of seizures, we can make a difference in, in these pets and people's lives. So today we're going to spend most of our time discussing the treatment of seizures. Um, we'll spend a little bit of time reviewing seizure pathophysiology and causes of seizures and uh, the diagnostic approach to seizures. Um, but I'm really going to try and make this as, as useful to you guys as possible. So I've, I've saved a fair amount of time at the end of this for a, a Q&A. <clears throat> what exactly is a seizure? Uh, a, a seizure is the clinical manifestation of, of excessive and or hypersynchronous electrical activity in the cerebral cortex. So what, what I say to, to owners, it's, it's abnormal and excessive electrical activity in, in the front part of the brain. So a seizure isn't actually a disease. A seizure is a, a symptom. It's a uh, what we see on the outside when there's this abnormal electrical activity happening on the inside of the brain. Seizures are often described as focal or generalized. Uh, a focal seizure is when the excessive and or hypersynchronous electrical activity is limited to one region of the cerebral cortex. Clinically, we might see uh, one part of the body or one part of the face have rhythmic contractions. Sometimes consciousness is uh, affected, sometimes consciousness is preserved. Alternatively, uh, the abnormal electrical activity can affect the entire cerebral cortex, causing generalized seizures as we've all seen. In generalized clonic tonic seizures, patients lose consciousness, they can paddle, uh, their jaws may chomp, they fall on their side, they salivate, they urinate, they defecate can last anywhere from a few seconds to a few minutes. Most dogs act abnormally before the seizure and most are disoriented after the episode. Um, many dogs act blind or confused after the seizure event. So th typically this is happening at home and they're coming to us 
after the dog's back to normal. So it's very episodic. And because it's episodic, we need to think of our, our clinical approach a little bit differently. Um, because they're normal, uh, a thorough history is imperative. Really, a, a video, you know, I, I, I used to say Steve Jobs changed the way that we, we practice veterinary neurology, and it, it really has, because everybody has a, a camera in their pocket now. So um, we're often able to actually see what the episode looks like from beginning to end. The thorough history uh, is typically followed by a physical and neurological examination. And by performing that physical and neurological e examination, we're able to come to an accurate anatomic localization. Uh, and using that anatomic localization, we should be able to come up with a reasonable list of possible causes or our differential diagnoses. Armed with that list, we can come up with our series of tests to rule out things outside of the brain and things inside of the brain, and hopefully come to a specific diagnosis. Based off of that specific diagnosis, we can formulate a treatment plan and give those pet parents a uh, reasonably accurate prognosis. <clears throat> the history is paramount, especially when or, or if the episodes aren't witnessed firsthand. Uh, signalment is important in that the age of onset strongly influences our differential diagnosis. Patients younger than one year of age are much more likely to have things like congenital malformations. They're more likely to get things like infections. They're more likely to have metabolic or toxic causes of seizures. Whereas older patients are more likely to have structural causes, such as brain tumors and strokes. Idiopathic epilepsy typically occurs in dogs where their first seizure comes on between one and five years of age. Some people will say one and six years of age, uh, but the, the, the general idea is kind of that, that young adult, one to five, one to six year of age, when they have their first seizure. Said another way, it's unlikely that if you're presented with a, a three-month-old dog or a 13-year-old dog, it's just much less likely that that pet is going to have idiopathic epilepsy. Breed is also important in that the uh, list of concerns for a one-year-old Yorkie is very different than our list of differentials for a three-year-old German Shepherd uh, and is very different than those for our 10-year-old Golden Retriever. A thorough description of the episode is also very, very useful. Um, so getting a, a sense, if we don't have that video, and sometimes the video um, just captures the, the middle part or more often the end after the actual episode. Uh, if, if any of you have seen owner videos sometimes, um, and understandably they're, they're so frantic that sometimes the video actually doesn't, doesn't show the pet at all. Um, so we need to ask a lot of questions. We should be asking what the pet is doing immediately before the, the episode. Uh, is, is the pet asleep? Is the pet in bed? Uh, is the pet excited? You know, are we being active? Are we running around the park? Are we uh, excited that, that, that the pet parent's home? Um, does it happen at a particular time of day? Does it happen in relationship to eating? Does it happen in relationship to any sort of stimulating factor? how long does the episode last? You know, we'll have people coming in and saying that, you know, their, their dog's having a seizure and it's been going on for, you know, for, for, for two days now. Um, just when we hear that, that makes us think a little bit differently than classic seizures, which last, you know, seconds to, to a, a few minutes. We also ask, how long does it take for the pet to return to normal after the event? Um, again, most dogs with seizures, they are disoriented afterwards or may act blind afterwards, whereas when we see a dog that uh, kind of goes from having the episode to going back to normal very, very quickly, our thought process might change a little bit. We also need to question the pet owner of, of what the patient's behavior is like in between episodes. Are they acting normal? Are they acting confused, lost? Uh, things like that that are just, again, going to change how we approach this patient and, and what our thought process is. Again, video is a big deal, it, it helps a lot. 
So the first step in treating seizures is actually making sure that it's a seizure to begin with. Uh, several disorders can mimic seizures, and it's important for us to distinguish these mimickers um, from true seizures so that we don't accidentally or inadvertently go down the wrong diagnostic path. For example, this is a dog with idiopathic head bobbing or idiopathic head tremors. You can see we seem relatively alert, but um, this was actually uh, confused for a seizure or referred to us for a seizure of, uh, event. Usually with idiopathic head tremors, we classically see it in certain breeds uh, like bulldogs and bulldog mixes. Um, occasionally we'll see it in Doberman pinchers. And uh, it's not a seizure. It's not an abnormal burst of electrical activity in the, the cerebral cortex. Many times we can distract these dogs out of the event. This dog um, has tetanus, but you can see we're, we're laterally recumbent. You know, we, we, we fell over, we're hypersalivating, um, and we, we kind of go stiff. We're not really paddling, but we're going stiff. Um, and this could easily be mistaken for a seizure. This dog presented to us for these rhythmic contractions of groups of muscles. Um, the, the back right leg was also doing something similar. Uh, it, it started doing that about a week after we, we met the dog for you know the, the head muscles doing this. But this is myoclonus um, that we associated with canine distemper virus. And, and then the last video I'm going to show you of a uh, a seizure mimicker is is narcolepsy. Um, sometimes when it's dramatic like this, and you know the, the dogs are snoring and things like that, it's it's easier for us to tell. But sometimes with narcolepsy, it, it can be hard to say is that a a a, a seizure, is that syncope, um, or is that something like narcolepsy, which is much less common, so we don't think about it quite as often. So a, a, again. Our first step is trying to figure out, is it actually a seizure? Uh, things like syncope, vestibular disease. Um, usually with vestibular disease, when you're examining, it's not that hard to be uh, confused by it, but many times owners will call us and say, my dog's having a seizure, but it's actually having a vestibular event. Um, we actually did just have a pet earlier this week that came to us for seizures, but on, on further examination and further uh, questioning of the owner, that dog was having episodes of, of alligator rolling, and on our examination, we found uh, vertical nystagmus. So um, vestibular disease can mimic seizures. Pain, occasionally we'll see a dog that's just, you know, has neck pain or has severe pain, and that can mimic a seizure. Uh, certainly behavioral things, so OCD, I'm making quote signs, I know you can't see me right now, but OCD type uh, things. Um, Fly biting, uh, chewing at the back end, things like that can all be mistaken for seizures. Again, we talked about narcolepsy, uh, head tremors, myoclonus, uh, et cetera, can all be confused for a seizure. So the next step in our clinical approach is our, our examination. So our physical examination and our neurological examination. Um, a complete physical exam helps us rule out things like syncope. Um, but moving on to the neuro exam, that really helps us say where in the nervous system is the problem so that we can come up with that list of differentials. Seizures by themselves tell us that there's a problem in the front part of the brain or the cerebral cortex, but recognizing other signs such as head pressing, uh, abnormal mentation as we see in the picture in the upper left, uh, walking in circles as we see in the upper right, cranial nerve deficits, uh, such as an absent menace response, uh, absent nasal sensation, et cetera, especially when it's asymmetric. So, you know, we, we've got a normal menace on the one side, but not on the other. Postural reaction deficits, uh, again, especially if they're asymmetric. And focal seizures all help us to further localize the problem to the cerebral cortex or within the cerebral cortex. But beware the postictal exam. So if a dog's just had a seizure or a cat, um, has just had a seizure, 
we need to interpret that exam with caution because sometimes dogs and cats are are abnormal right after the exam. So um, if the animals just had a seizure, we still need to do that exam, but we should come back a little later and, and re-examine uh, to make sure that it's not just because of postictal changes. I tend to think of causes of seizures um, in, in three main causes of seizures, and that just works for me to also think of my diagno diagnostic approach. Um, so depending on where you went to school and, and when you went to school, you may have learned it in a different way, um, but this is the way that I like to, to conceptualize it in my mind. I think of causes of seizures in dogs and cats as three main things. Uh, the first broad category is something outside of the brain. You may have learned it as extracranial, you may have learned it as metabolic, but in essence what we mean is something that's not physically structurally wrong with the brain, something that's affecting the brain to cause the seizure. Uh, examples include things like hypoglycemia, uh, severe liver disease, severe kidney disease, uh, toxins, poisons, portosystemic shunt, things like that. And generally, we can test for these things with blood tests. So a CBC chemistry panel, you know, a bile acids if appropriate, things like thyroid, urinalysis, etc. The second broad category of causes of seizures are things inside of the brain. Uh, you may have learned it as intracranial, you may have learned it as structural problems, um, but in essence we mean a physical structural problem within the brain. Examples are things like brain tumors, meningitis, encephalitis, strokes, malformations like hydrocephalus, uh, infections, etc. And the vast majority of these we're testing for with things like MRIs and spinal taps. Sometimes there are some ancillary tests uh, certain infectious disease testing, certain genetic testing for uh, degenerative or storage diseases. But typically, uh, an MRI and spinal tap are going to be warranted to look inside of the brain. And then the third main cause of seizures is what we call idiopathic epilepsy. It's the most common cause of seizures in dogs, um, and it's much less common in cats. There are a couple generalizations that we make about dogs with idiopathic epilepsy. Again, like we said before, usually the first seizure comes on between one and five years of age. And you know, some people will say one to six years, some people will say six months to six years, but again, that, that general range. Typically, the seizures are classic generalized clonic tonic seizures. So that whole body, loose consciousness, fall on our side, salivate, you know, urinate, defecate, etc. They are normal between episodes. Again, this is where our history comes uh, comes in. And then they have a normal neurologic examination. So idiopathic epilepsy, although it's the most common, it is a diagnosis of exclusion. So we don't diagnose it just because a dog has seizures, we call it idiopathic epilepsy. Idiopathic epilepsy is a diagnosis of, diagnosis of exclusion, meaning we need to rule out things outside of the brain with our blood tests, et cetera, and things inside of the brain with things like MRIs and, and spinal taps. So anybody that's met me knows a, a little bit of my, my soapbox is um, appropriate diagnostics. Uh, and, and we tend to reach for the, the best diagnostic that's going to give us the most information with the least amount of risk to the patient um, and cut to the chase to try and find the answer. So oftentimes, uh, much less nowadays, but uh, I'll, I'll get a call that says, hey, we're sending over for a CT or an MRI or, or whatever test you want to do, Dr. Wong. And it's just important for not just us as neurologists, but us as veterinarians to be recommending the appropriate tests to, to pet parents. Um, this is a, a CT scan on the left here and an MRI on the right. And the CT was performed by a, a surgeon friend of mine that was trying to evaluate this bony uh, protrusion in, on the frontal bone here. So he wasn't trying to do it to look at the brain, but I, I use it to illustrate how little we can see in the brain here um, whereas the bone shows up really, really nicely, but brain parenchyma kind of looks very, very similar to, 
to muscle and to muscle of the tongue, et cetera. So we can't make a whole lot out here. Whereas the MRI, we just get so much more detail. And sure, if there's a, a, um, a, a, a fracture or a large brain tumor, um, specific type such as a, a, a meningioma, many times we can get that diagnosis, but it just leaves us open to missing the diagnosis for uh, smaller tumors. Um, certain tumors can look like other things like strokes on a, on a CT scan, whereas we can better delineate that on an MRI. Um, strokes, encephalitis, uh, metabolic problems, degenerative problems, just there are lots of things that we're going to miss on a CT that we're going to catch on an MRI. So um, it's, it's not the same and um, I would say 99.999% of the time we are recommending an MRI over a CT. Caveat there is it's not that one is bad and one is good. They, they can work together, but for most of the things that we're looking for, an MRI is going to be much more sensitive for showing those things. But there are certain instances where we do like CT scans or we at least use them in conjunction with an MRI. So we've looked at differential diagnosis based off of broad categories, but from a clinical standpoint, um, we're really trying to not just list a whole bunch of things that it could be, we're trying to narrow it down to the most likely things and sort that list uh, based off of, um, sort that list off of, of what is most likely and what's uh, least likely. Again, signalment and history play a huge role in that, but the neuro exam further refines your differential list. Uh, for example, differential diagnoses for patients with a normal neurological exam, um, again, idiopathic epilepsy, uh, metabolics, so, um, you know, that low blood sugar, uh, hypoglycemia, excuse me, <laughs> hypoglycemia, poor systemic shunt, things like that, many times can have a, a normal neurological examination. But you can still have a physical problem, structural problem inside of the brain, um, like a brain tumor, that, but you still have a, a normal exam. So you can't rule that out but it sort of uh, plays into your list of differentials. When we have an abnormal neurological examination, our thought process starts changing. So things like idiopathic epilepsy start becoming a lot lower on our, our worry list. And we think of things like uh, malformations, inflammation, infection, uh, trauma, stroke, neoplasia, et cetera. So in the next series of, of images, um, they're, they're all gonna be MRI images that are uh, a transverse, so a, a, a slice of bread. So if the dog's nose is this way, the back of the head is here, it's gonna be a slice of bread that way and then opened up so that we can kind of see it on the inside. So to orient you, this slice came right where this line is. And let's say this is the dog's right ear, or excuse me, right side left side, dorsals at the top of the image, ventrals at the bottom of the image. And this is our uh, trachea, this is the skull, these are the bones, excuse me, the muscles uh, outside of the skull. And this type of image is called a, a flare or a fluid attenuated inversion recovery, where basically what we do is we nullify or make fluid look dark. So we can see this malformation here in this particular puppy uh, where there is a malformation where the brain parenchyma either did not form correctly um, or was um, pushed away, for lack of a better term, by this, this fluid that goes all the way out from the, the skull and connects with the ventricular system. Same orientation, different dog, um, and it's just a little bit uh, a, a little bit further cranial or excuse me, a little bit further rostral. Um, and this is a post contrast T1 weighted image. So we've we've given contrast and before we gave contrast, none of this was bright. And after contrast, we could see that there's contrast enhancement um, following the covering or coverings of the brain or the meninges. Uh, when we did a spinal tap on this dog, 
we saw cryptococcal organisms. So this was an infectious cause of seizures in an abnormal neurological examination due to cryptococcus. This is a classic MRI for encephalitis. Again, same orientation, just a little bit further caudal to that last image, obviously different dog. But we can see this bright area, or what we call hyperintensity, following the white matter tracks of the cerebral cortex. So this is a, a classic MRI for something like inflammatory brain disease or encephalitis or MUE are, are all different terms that you may have heard describing encephalitis or inflammation. This type of MRI is what's called a gradient echo or T2 star weighted. And what we're doing is we're accentuating certain uh, certain types of tissue or certain types of substance in, in the body or in the brain. Um, and this type shows hemorrhage very well. So we can, with a, a fair degree of confidence, say that this dog had a hemorrhagic stroke to the brain. This is a cat. And again, it's a post-contrast MRI, but we can see this surface-based, broad, uh, it's contrast enhancing. So on the pre-contrast, it wasn't bright like this. Um, mass that's pressing in from the right side towards the left. This is a classic MRI for a feline meningioma. And then finally, uh, this is a, a dog with a degenerative brain disease. So we can see there's, there's um, deep sulci. Um, there's a, a degree of hydrocephalus. Um, the interthalamic adhesion is, is shorter or not as tall. Uh, so again, something that we can, with a reasonable degree of certainty, diagnose via MRI. So again, things that we think of for dogs with seizures in an abnormal neurological examination, malformations, uh, infection, inflammation, injury, neoplasia, and degeneration. So MRI is the best test to image the brain, and it's indicated in, in most patients with seizures, um, but there are specific situations um, that, that we really like it, particularly when the exam, the signalment, the history make idiopathic epilepsy less likely. For example, dogs younger than one year of age or older than five or six. So, you know, if, if we have a 14 year old dog that has its first seizure, we shouldn't be thinking things like idiopathic epilepsy. Um, if we have a three or four month old dog, um, we shouldn't be thinking things like idiopathic epilepsy. So that's one indication for further tests. If the pet is acting abnormal between episodes, that's another indication. So if you know we have a seizure on Sunday and we have another seizure on you know the following Tuesday, but the owner's saying you know she just seems lost or spaced out or doesn't know where she is, those are things. Even if that dog is four years old. Um, those are things that should be raising a red flag that maybe we should be doing further tests or investigating further. If your neurological examination is abnormal, so again, we expect dogs and cats with idiopathic epilepsy to have normal neurological examinations, but if we see things like uh, decreased levels of consciousness, walking in circles, cranial nerve abnormalities, postural reaction deficits, etc., again, that should be the leaning us away from idiopathic epilepsy and should be pushing us more towards trying to figure out the underlying cause. Again, cats don't get idiopathic epilepsy nearly as commonly as dogs do. So most cats, or excuse me, pretty much all cats with seizures, um, an MRI or further diagnostics are, are warranted. Certain breeds, so even if you have that four-year-old um, Maltese or four-year-old terrier, um, even though they're normal between episodes and, you know, between one and five years of age, if I see a, you know, breed that's predisposed to things like 
uh, encephalitis or predisposed to, to brain tumors like a Boston Terrier or a Boxer or a Golden Retriever, those are all patients that um, my recommendation is going to lean more towards recommending tests to these pet owners. But really, any pet with seizures, um, or I guess I should say most pets with seizures and normal um, blood tests, an MRI is going to give us further information so that we can better say to that owner what's going on and what we can do to try and help. So we'll go over treatment of seizures now, and I, I guess there are a couple points that I want to make here. Um, there isn't a one best medication or one best protocol. Um, if you ask, you know, the six different neurologists at Southeast Veterinary Neurology, there's going to be a fair amount of overlap in how we do it, but there's going to be a fair amount of, of differences in, in how we do, how we manage uh, seizures as well. So um, I'm going to go over um, more treatment principles as opposed to um, getting into you know, use this drug first or something like that. So the first treatment principle is, is when. Um, when should we start treatment? When should we be doing levels? When should we consider different medications, et cetera? So, you know, j just uh, yesterday on our Q&A, we, we, we were reunited with a, a pet we had seen, you know, two years before that had seizures and we did an MRI and diagnosed with idiopathic epilepsy, but the seizures were only occurring every nine months. So we actually decided not to start um, medications in that dog years ago. So not all dogs with seizures, you know, do we start immediately? When do we start? Um, I'll typically start anti-seizure medications um, for any episode of unprovoked status epilepticus. Um, patients that have multiple seizures in a short period of time. Uh, if over time the frequency of the seizures or the severity of the seizures are increasing, or in patients where there's an underlying or progressive disorder, um, such as a brain tumor, whether we've diagnosed it or whether we just strongly suspect it based off of signalment and exam, et cetera. Uh, the next treatment principle that, that um, I, I see veterinarians sometimes, you know, be less comfortable with is, is treating early. Um, patients that are treated early in the course of epilepsy may have longer, better, excuse me, better long-term control of their seizures compared to those that we, um, we, we don't start medications and, you know, the frequency is becoming more and more and the severity is becoming more and more. So um, if we see that, we want to be starting medications. The next when to talk about is when should we be testing levels? And we should be testing levels for, for, for most of these drugs. Um, I particularly do it in the drugs that um, have a, a sort of more narrowed uh, therapeutic window. So the phenobarbitals, the potassium bromides. Um, but I test levels whenever steady state kinetics have been, been reached um, after starting a dose, or after changing a dose, or after a loading dose. Um, I check levels when seizures aren't adequately controlled despite apparently adequate doses. So if we have a, a, a dog on a you know, 60 mg per kg dose of, of Keppra, um, or a you know, 4 mg per kg dose of phenobarbital, and we're not getting adequate control, you know, I, I want to make sure that the level is appropriate based off of what we're giving um, or should be giving as a dose. I check levels whenever there are signs of toxicity. Um, and even if things are going really, really well, I'll still check levels ideally every six months. Occasionally, if things are going really, really well and they've been going well for, for years, sometimes I'll get patients where I only check them once a year. Um, but ideally checking those levels at least twice a year, or excuse me, twice a year. The, the next treatment principle that, that I'll cover is, is what. So what drug, what dose, um, et cetera. 
And again, there's no one best drug that if you follow this, you know, drug A, then drug B, then drug C, we're going to cure 100% of seizures. That's just, that's not the world that we currently live in. So we need to become comfortable with a variety of, of medications. We should be comfortable with their side effects, their dosing, um, you know, what sort of adverse effects we can see so that we can be coaching the, the pet parents with that. Um, in general, my first-line anti-epileptic drugs are, are Keppra and Phenobarbital. I, I would say, you know, for probably 90 plus percent of patients that I see, they're getting one of those drugs as, as their first drug. And I, I choose those because I'm comfortable with their doses, I'm comfortable with their side effects, I'm comfortable with their monitoring, and, and I feel that they're efficacious for the majority, excuse me, the majority of my patients. Um, what what dose? Start at, at a solid dose. So too often I see pets being underdosed um, due to the, the, the clinician's fear of the side effects of the drug. So, you know, I'll, I'll meet dogs that are on one mg per kg of phenobarbital or, you know, two mg per kg, but they're giving it once a day or something like that. And I, I, I get it. I mean, none of us want to cause harm. Um, none of us uh, want those those pet owners to you know see those side effects and um, take their dog off off the drugs. Um, but by under treating, we're more likely to not get the desired effect of the medications, and those owners are more likely to say, "Well, gosh, that we tried that drug and it and it didn't work, so um, we we moved away from it." The, the next treatment principle is I try and maximize in general, one drug before adding a second or a third or abandoning the first. So um, this kind of goes hand in hand with starting that solid dose. So it, uh, too often I see a dog that was getting underdosed on drug number one and we never checked levels and we never tried to increase drug number one before adding in drug number two. And sure, there's something to be said of um, you know, using lower doses of, of each, um, but from an owner's perspective, you know, the more drugs we're giving, and if it's not helping because we're under treating, the more likely we're going to lose their their confidence, um, and they're going to think that that was ineffective. And the, the next treatment principle is use those drug levels to make objective measurements. Um, so. We'll see dogs where we're expecting, you know, based off we're giving a relatively, you know, high dose of, of say, phenobarbital. But then when we do our phenobarbital level, we find that it's really, really low. And that just helps me say, well, gosh, owner, how are you giving the drug? Where are you getting it from? Um, did we get a new new prescription? Um, who's giving it? Is, is it, you know, are there two or three different people in the household giving it? Um, are we are we missing doses, et cetera? So serum drug levels just give us one more objective measure for us to not by itself say what we should be doing with the drug, um, but gives us one more information point for us to say, how can we optimize this dog's therapy? Next treatment principle is client education. Um, and I, I can't tell you how much spending that extra 15 to 30 minutes to talk with that owner and just discuss with them. It's going to save you hours upon hours of phone calls down the road. It's going to lead to a better outcome for the pet. The clients are going to be happier. Um, it's going to, um, as much as possible, keep them from asking Dr. Google. Um, so when we talk with these owners, you know, there, there are important things that, that they need to know that kind of um, are, are on all of our discharge instructions. Um, we talk about the pros and cons of medications. So, you know, owners need to understand that we're, you know, we're not just giving these medications because we want to. Um, we're doing it because the pros of the medication, in our opinion, are going to outweigh the cons. The, the likelihood of us helping their pet outweighs the downsides of you know, having to give the medication, the costs of, of buying the medications, the potential adverse effects. Um, we need to talk to them about those adverse effects so that when they're expecting it, when they know that this is going to happen 
that their dog might be a little sleepy or a little wobbly, but it's going to get better um, after a, a week or so, they're much more likely to say, okay, understand, deep breath, th this is fine. We do need to say, okay, your dog's gonna be a little sleepy, but if it's severe, this is when I want you to call me. Um, we need to talk with them up front about the the, the long-term plan. Um, so many people come in thinking that, you know, we're just gonna give the medication for for a while and then the seizures are going to be cured. People need to know that the vast majority of patients that we put on medications are going to require lifelong medications. There are exceptions, but the vast majority are going to. So we need to be on board with the regular administration. We need to be on board with the regular monitoring. We need to be on board with the coming in for regular examinations. And again, just I find when a client knows all of this up front, they just feel a whole lot better of, okay, this is the plan. I know that I'm coming back in a month to check levels and I'm coming back in six months you know, to, for, for re-examination. And they don't feel quite as much that we're just you know, doing it willy-nilly. Um, importance of regular administration of, of the drugs. You know, certain dogs need those drugs right on time. Um, so we should be aiming to be as precise or as on schedule as we can be. But understanding that you know people live in the real world and not everyone is at home at 8 a.m., 4 p.m., and midnight, or you know can 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 give it when we would give it in the hospital. So um, we need to set the expectation of here's our goal, but we understand this is this is the real world. If you can give it before you leave for work, you know as soon as you get home from work and last thing before bed, you know we we, we know you're doing your best and you know, that's what we're going to aim for. But certain people simply can't give three times a day medications, period. And that comes, uh, that's a discussion we need to have up front so that we're choosing the appropriate drugs uh, that set that dog up for success. Last thing is having the owners keep a log of seizure activity. So when do they happen? How long do they last? Um, and, and, and that combined with our medical record of, okay, we increased the dosage here, and this was the level, you know, on that date, okay, you know, the seizure frequency is definitely increasing, we need to do something different. Um, or, or hopefully the seizure frequency and severity are decreasing, all right, we're good. Along with client education, we need to talk with them about, um, about the goals. Like I said before, some people think, you know, we just give the medication for a couple of weeks. In, in Leah's video, um, you know, you, you heard the one girl say, you know, I thought you gave the medication. I don't understand why are we having a seizure. And and uh, again, just explaining things that even despite despite doing everything perfectly, despite um, being on the quote unquote right medications, um, we still expect dogs to have seizures and spending that extra time to give them reasonable expectations are going to set them and and us up for success. So my goal of, of seizure therapy is to reduce the frequency and severity of the seizures to a level that doesn't compromise quality of life um, for the pet and for the family while avoiding serious side effects. So we're, we're trying to balance things. I know you can't see me right now, but I'm, I'm sort of making a scales with my hands. So we're trying to balance the um, the, the good effects with the negative effects. All right, uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about, about drugs, um, not a whole lot, but um, just sort of introduce sort of the, 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 the four drugs that I use most frequently. Um, again, phenobarbital and Keper are kind of my first two main drugs. Um, just a few years ago, I, I would have been saying phenobarbital and bromide, um, but I, in the last eight, 10 years, um, just Kepra has become less expensive. Kepra um, has come out in a, a extended release so that for certain dogs, we can give it twice a day. So 
many of the negative things that 10 years ago made it harder for us to prescribe Keppra just aren't uh, aren't there anymore. So many times I'm using phenobarbital or Keppra as my first line drug. Phenobarbital, um, it's my one of my first two in dogs and my my first line anticonvulsant in cats. The dose, uh, you can read it there, but two and a half to four mg per kg orally twice a day, two and a half mg per kg twice a day in cats. Um, so again, that that that's starting at one, one and a half mg per kg twice a day or giving it once a day is, is not an appropriate dose. Um, but the dose should be tailored to the in individual patient. Uh, sometimes bigger dogs, if we're loading them or if we're giving them you know, kind of that four mg per kg dose just starting out, it's going to zonk them a little bit more. So, um, so tailor it to the individual patient. About two weeks are required to get to steady state. So I'll usually do my phenobarbital levels um, three weeks after starting the, the dose or changing a dose. Um, but if you've done a loading, you can check your phenobarbital level um, then. The loading dose of phenobarbital is 16 mg per kg divided over 24 hours. So um, I, I still will, will sometimes see here where dogs get a, a, a first dose of 16 mg per kg just kind of as that first shot. Um, seldom do I, I see that that's typically necessary, um, even in the emergency setting. Um, many times we can give sort of a 4 mg per kg dose and see do we get that that active seizure or that cluster of seizures under control and plan for six hours later another four mg per kg dose. Sometimes it needs to be a little sooner, sometimes it needs to be a little longer, again based off of is that dog continuing to have seizures? Again in the emergency situation is, is when I'm talking about doing this loading dose. Um, or is it really zonked and maybe we need to back off just a little bit and do it a little slower. But again 16 mg per kg um, divided over 24 hours. The level that we're shooting for, um, the the lab usually says 15 to 45. I like to keep my, my serum level in a much more narrow window, kind of in that 25 to 30 sort of my sweet spot. If I kind of start getting into that 20 or below, I feel like I'm under treating. If I'm getting in that 32 or above, I'm much more worried about uh, toxicity. Side effects include sedation, uh, ataxia, polyuria, polydipsia, etc. Occasionally we'll see blood dyscrasias um, that are idiosyncratic, um, very, very rare. I, I think I've only seen it twice and heard about it from a, a vet calling me twice. Um, I expect the liver enzymes to be elevated, uh, specifically the, the ALKFOS. So if I see that, that by itself, if dogs otherwise doing well, is not a reason for us to um, modify or stop therapy. Um, but we are more likely to run into those side effects or, or excuse me, liver damage when we are getting those um, blood concentrations higher than 35. Keppra, um, I, I should update this slide. Uh, to me, the starting dose is 30 mg per kg three times a day. Um, occasionally, uh, th there's a, a dog that will sort of fit into the 20 mg per kg um, dose, but for most dogs that are having true um, generalized clonic tonic seizures, I'll start at 30 mg per kg three times a day for the regular release. There is an extended release that comes in um, 500 milligram and 750 milligram sizes. We can't break those into uh, smaller ones, so they're really only appropriate for, for medium to larger dogs. Um, we like Keppra because it's just really, really safe. I mean, you, you could give you could overdose and it's not going to cause you know severe problems. So I'll usually start in that 20 to 30 mg per kg and then go to 40 and then go to 60. Some of the neurologists here, you know, on occasion will go to 100 mg per kg. Um, usually when I'm at, at 60, that's kind of when I'm looking at a, a second or third drug. It's not metabolized by the liver, so it makes it a nice sort of one-two punch with phenobarbital, um, assuming that we're needing uh, both of them. It's also nice for 
animals that have poor systemic shunts. Um, it's my preferred add-on for cats after phenobarbital. Minimal side effects, transient sedation. Occasionally, we'll get dogs that we add uh, Keppra, and they do fantastic. And then um, a, a couple months later, we kind of fall back to that baseline seizure frequency. So that's what we call a, a honeymoon effect. Um, I like it as a first-line drug. I, I really also like it for what, what I call weird seizures. So you know, when it's not that generalized clonic-tonic seizure, you know, it's a focal seizure, a fly-biting seizure. Um, you know, kind of these myotonic jerks when a um, in, in response to sound or light. Um, but where I, I, I don't use it is if the owner says it's just impossible for me to give it three times a day for my small breed dog. Bromide, um, it's kind of a, a, a third or fourth drug for me nowadays. Um, the loading dose, so it has a really, really um, long half-life. So in order to get it to serum levels um, in a reasonable amount of time, we, we, we do a loading dose. The loading dose is 400 to 600 mg per kg, but I break that up over four, sometimes five days, again, depending on what the patient needs. Um, if it needs it faster, we do it a little faster. If uh, it doesn't need it quite that fast, um, I'll, I'll do sort of what we call a mini load. I test levels at about three months. Um, after starting or changing a dose. It's renally excreted. So again, we can kind of use these for dogs with uh, liver disease or um, as an add-on to that dog on phenobarbital that, um, that we're worried about the, the liver. Side effects like phenobarbital, sedation, um, polyuria, polydipsia. Uh, we don't use it in cats because it can uh, cause a a, 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 a lung condition. Um, we avoid it in dogs with previous uh, history of pancreatitis. I'm not sure that it actually causes pancreatitis, um, but there is an association between the two. The nice thing is if we have a dog with pancreatitis or um, has a history of pancreatitis, we've got other options on drugs that we can use. So um, I, I usually reach for something else. Therapeutic range, uh, is one to three mg per ml. If I'm using it as a solo drug, I'm sort of shooting for that two to three, whereas if I'm adding it on, I'm looking for a, a range of one to two. And then zanisamide. Um, th this is kind of my, my number three or number four. Uh, it's a sulfonamide-based anticonvulsant. So um, the side effects we worry about are things like um, dry eye, uh, occasionally we can get IMHA, and to me, the, you know, th those sound scary, but those are, um, to me, it's the, the same exact conversation that I'm having with any pet owner um, about, hey, I don't expect these things to happen. Um, they can happen, and that's why we're going to need to follow up and, you know, stay in stay in in contact with each other. We're going to want to be doing uh, blood work every so often. But you know, for, for this drug, I'm, I'm doing a CBC and a chemistry panel um, when I'm doing my blood work. It is hepatically metabolized. Um, so if we've got that dog on phenobarbital and we're worried about the liver, usually zanisamide isn't what I'm reaching for next. Um, but sometimes we do use it in conjunction with phenobarbital. When we use it in conjunction with phenobarbital, uh, we actually have to use a higher dose. The dose is 10 mg per kg uh, orally twice a day. Whereas if we're using it as a sole drug um, without phenobarbital, it's five mg per kg. Um, again, I avoid for hepatic disease, um, previous IMHA or, or dry eye. So that's what I've got today. Um, I, I'd like to open up the rest for, for questions. Um, and, and Michelle, I don't know if you can bring the, the camera back up for me. There we are. So are, are there any questions in the question section? OK. 
Cannot hear. Oh, can you hear now? Um, so we've got a, a question here of when to decide should we use contrast for MRI or um, simple MRI, or I guess a non-contrast MRI. Um, pretty much for every brain, um, I, I cannot think of a, a reason that I would not use contrast on an MRI study of a brain, um, whether we're talking about seizures or whether we're talking about walking in circles or vestibular disease. Um, I, I can't think of a reason to um, not give contrast. From an MRI standpoint, I guess a little bit more general, there are times where I might not give contrast. Um, if it's that chondrodystrophic breed where I'm suspecting a slipped disc um, and I find an obvious slipped disc on the MRI, I usually won't give contrast there. Um, maybe an atlantoaxial instability, if, if I'm seeing um, seeing that. I gosh, I probably would still give contrast there. So um, I, I, I'd say 90, I'd say 95, 98% of times that we're doing MRIs, we are giving contrast. Um, yes, great question. So um, please comment on the use of intranasal midazolam for status epilepticus. So you know, when, when I went through school, when I went through my residency, um, it was we, we gave injectable diazepam and to to stop a, a seizure so that emergency dog that has come in and um we're trying to stop that active seizure and diazepam intranasally excuse me diazepam intravenously is is still a, a great drug um just sometimes it's hard to hit a uh a vein when that dog's act actively having a seizure um additionally at home you know owners don't have uh diazepam they can give Intra, intravenously, make sure I said it right that time. So intranasal midazolam is actually our, our go-to for stopping an active seizure, um, whether it's in the hospital or at home. Obviously, if we're in a hospital and we have a catheter, we use that. But at home, we use um, intranasal midazolam. So instead of trying to get it up the, the, the give rectal diazepam or rectal midazolam, um, we can give it intranasally. It's just that's an easier, cleaner area to to hit. Um, there are these things called atomizers, and you can't see my hand, but so we'll send it home in a syringe. And there's a little tip on the end of the syringe that, as you squeeze it, I guess I'm sort of picturing that that Afrin type commercial where they squeeze it and just this fine mist comes out, and that helps. Um, one with absorption, so it just gets into the body really, really quickly to help stop that active seizure. Two, it's just because it's a finer mist, it's going to stay up there as opposed to shooting up a liquid and it coming right back out of the um, the nose. There, there was a study, uh, maybe 2010 or so, um, 2014, somewhere in there, that looked and compared intranasal midazolam compared to... Um, I think it was rectal valium. I know it was valium. I'm not sure if it was rectal valium. Um, as to what was more efficacious and acted faster, and the um, conclusion of that was intranasal midazolam is is is, is better. It works faster um, and more efficacious. So a great question. Um, uh, question here: Has any work been done with diet and supplements regarding seizure control? Um, uh, hypoallergenic diets, uh, essential fatty acids, et cetera. Um, so uh, ketogenic diets were, were looked at because um, in, in, in people there was a, um, th there's evidence that it helps certain people have less seizures. Um, the studies in dogs have not suggested that the ketogenic diet uh, decreases seizures. Um, uh, maybe five years ago or so, um, there was a, a study looking at medium chain triglycerides um, as an adjunct to uh, standard therapy. So um, in that study, uh, dogs that were given a diet rich in medium chain triglycerides um, had a decreased number of seizures or, or better seizure control uh, compared to a, a control group. Um, so that diet, it, it's one of these things that does not replace 
treatment, excuse me, uh, standard treatment, um, but can be used in addition as sort of a supplementary. Um, so we can give Keppra human for dogs and cats. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, I guess before it was generic, that's what we were using. We were actually getting, you know, Keppra, human Keppra. Um, it, it's still human Leviterastam and, and, and human Keppra, but it's it's not that. So if if your question is, can we use the brand name Keppra? Absolutely. Um, it it is on. Uh, it's it's a generic now, so we buy Leviterastam. Um, but sometimes when we prescribe it out. The pharmacy only carries Keppra. So, but uh, if I'm understanding your question, um, whether it's Keppra or Levetiracetam, both are fine. Um, if your question's, you know, um, can, can we use human drugs? Um, yes, we do that that all the time. Um, uh, do we modify epileptics vaccine protocol moving forward? I.e., can vaccines make epilepsy worse? Um, to my knowledge, there's no uh evidence to suggest that that vaccines um cause seizures or exacerbate seizures um the one caveat there and this is where it becomes important for us to understand the underlying cause of the seizures so let's say that dog has seizures secondary to inflammatory brain disease or encephalitis or mue or whatever we're going to call it um that would be a dog that um i'm not necessarily trying to because of the seizure standpoint, but just because of the, the brain inflammation, the um, overactive immune system. So that would be the, the, the one time that I would be um, saying, hey, maybe we should modify our, our vaccine protocol. Again, not because of seizures, but because of one particular underlying cause of seizures. Um, hepatic failure with status epilepticus, what should be treatment? regimen um i i'm i'm gonna answer that of hepatic failure of 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 dog receiving phenobarbital um is is i i guess how i'm more frequently asked that question you know hey dr wong i've got this dog that's been on phenobarbital for years seizures are relatively well well controlled but you know the liver enzymes have been going up you know and it's not just the alkfos it's the ggt it's the ast we it's the bilirubin we've done a belly ultrasound and we've done a bile acids and we're convinced that there's um there there's active liver disease um so i, I guess th that's point number one is many times people will call me dogs got elevated alkfos you know should i take this dog off and that's kind of my next question is how's the dog doing on the medications What's the seizure control like? Um, and uh, how sure are we that there's actually liver damage as opposed to just um, elevated ALKFOS? And I'm looking at things like, uh, is the bilirubin elevated? Is the GGT elevated? Um, what are the bile acids, uh, et cetera? So let's say we do have a dog legitimately, you know, doing well on, on phenobarbital, um, but uh, legitimately has hepatic dysfunction you know whether it's because of the drugs or whether it's because of something else and we need to consider switching to something else so again my, my go-to's are going to be either keppra or potassium bromide again we're trying to spare the liver so um, avoid zanisamide um, depending on how severe that dog is affected with the liver and how well it's doing on the medications on the phenobarbital uh, kind of dictate how quickly I'm decreasing the phenobarbital. Um, if, for instance, seizures are really, really hard to control and we're just starting to get into liver dysfunction, I might decrease that slower and give the Keppra longer to 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 get into the, not get into the system, but um, give the so, some more time for for the Keppra to do its thing or the potassium bromide or whatever. Whereas if that dog is um, really, really well controlled, it only has a seizure every six months, but you know the liver damage or liver disease is is severe, I'll decrease it faster um, and and cover myself with the the phenobarbital. Um, does the severity of the situation episodes influence first drug of choice? 
Um, yes. So, sorry. The, the question is: Does the severity of the situation episodes influence influence first uh, first choice of drug? Um, yes, to to an extent, it's it's part of it. Um, some of it is also just you know clinician um, clinician preference. So a dog with status epilepticus that's coming in or cluster seizures, you know, across the board here is going to get that first dose of of midazolam. Um, from there, some of it depends on what the dog's already on. Let's pretend the dog's not on any drugs. Um, first time uh, cluster seizures comes into the hospital. Um, you know, to me, in, intravenous, uh, Keppra versus intravenous phenobarbital, um, I would probably give that, that particular dog intravenous Keppra first, but my bet is very quickly it would also be getting some intravenous uh, phenobarbital. Um, so I'm not sure that I answered that real well for you. Uh, can patients develop a tolerance to Keppra? Um, we certainly see that that honeymoon uh, type effect um, where it works relatively well for the few month, first few months and then they go back to sort of their, their baseline. Um, but with, with any drug, uh, I guess I don't want to call it a tolerance, but um, it's not one of these, you know, sort of set it and forget it. You know, over time, yeah, if we're seeing the seizure frequency, I guess the seizure frequency is increasing, I want to be making sure, you know, am I giving appropriate doses, am I maximizing doses, you know, whether it's phenobarbital or whether it's Keppra. So, um, so it's, it's not so much a, a question of tolerance, it's a question of, of how that dog's doing. Um, if that dog is having continued, or I, I guess you'd say more frequent, more severe seizure episodes over time as we've been on the same dose of Keppra, I'm going to be thinking, yes, should I be in increasing it? Uh, just talked about honeymoon effect. Um, how would I transition from phenobarbital to Keppra or from Keppra to phenobarbital? Um, I, I'm sorry that I keep answering, it depends. Um, and I, I sort of started touching on it on that phenobarbital example of the dog with, with liver disease. It depends on the dog's severity of liver disease, meaning how fast do I want to get off the phenobarbital um, versus the severity of the dog's seizures, meaning how much am I worried as I'm taking away that phenobarbital, are the seizures going to become more frequent? Um, so one, you know, going back to treatment principles, if I'm starting that dog on on Keppra, you know, I'm definitely starting in that 30 to 40 range as opposed to you know the the 20 to 30. I like to stay on the the Keppra for a little bit before starting to decrease the phenobarbital. Again, it's um, uh, often dictated by the dog's clinical picture and you know the severity of seizures and the severity of the liver disease of how fast I'm decreasing. You know, but I'm usually almost never decreasing real fast, like over, you know, stopping cold turkey or anything like that. I'll, I'll try and cut that phenobarbital in half and then, you know, in half again and then in half again and try and wean off over three months or so. Um, again, depending on severity of seizures, depending on severity of, of liver disease. So on an ER basis, if loading dose of Capra is not sufficient for seizure control, um, should dose be increased or just part of, or just start phenobarbital? Um, so yeah, let, let's say we've given that. And M Michelle, are, are are we offering that sort of status epilepticus protocol as a as a download, or are they getting that automatically? So we, we have a status epilepticus protocol, um, a, a nice sheet. I'll make sure that we, we get that sent to, to you guys. And it's in general um, how we do things here. Um, so we'll typically give a, a 60 mg per kg loading dose of, of, of Keppra. Um, but then I will plan on, so I've given that 60 mg per kg dose and you know four hours, six hours later, I'm planning on you know next dose at 30 mg per kg. 
and and that's my general plan from the ER standpoint then, but dog's going to tell me, is that a good plan or not? Um, if let's say that seizure, second seizure happens you know, much faster, yeah, we can sort of accelerate when we're giving that next dose of Keppra. Um, if we're finding ourselves that we're, you know, we're on sort of dose number three already, yeah, I would be reaching for things like um, a four mg per kg dose of phenobarbital. Um, I would be considering things like a midazolam CRI. Um, on, a, on an ER basis. Um, in, in the local ERs, I, I, I do see a fair amount of going, you know, uh, fairly quickly to, to things like like propofol. But if you've got um, midazolam in the in the ER, um, if you've got phenobarbital, if you've got uh, the, the, the Keppra, those are kind of my three preferred drugs that. Um, I'm going to knock on wood so that a status epilepticus dog doesn't walk in the door right now, but I, I, I'd say 95 plus percent of dogs with those three medications, um, I feel pretty good that I can get them through that cluster. Uh, can I suggest a good book for neurology? Um, th there are, are, are lots of, of great ones. Um, kind of when I was in, in veterinary school, um, I would always carry around uh, uh, Dewey's first edition called A Practical Guide to Canine and Feline Neurology. Um, I, I think we're on the fourth edition right now. Um, that, that's kind of, I like it from a clinical standpoint. Um, some of the other neurologists here don't like it quite as much from a clinical standpoint. Um, there's the, the BSAVA manual. Um, there's the uh, Coates and Cornegay um, one. Um, no talk about textbooks in, in neurology would be complete without uh, Dr. Delahunta and Dr. Glass and Dr. Kent's. Um, we're done. Okay. Um, textbook. So uh, lo lots of good ones. Um, the question here: Valium rectally for owners at home. So I, I, I assume that we're. Um, we're asking that because of what I had said before. Um, so, so yes, the uh, diazepam rectally, but the diazepam, um, I, ideally we get suppositories. Um, so there's the, the diastat gel um, that, that can be sent home. Certain compounding pharmacies will, will get it together. Um, but this, just to be clear, is not you know a diazepam pill um, rectally. It's the diazepam injectable that we would use in-house less than ideal going home um, in that it usually, um, well, it's light sensitive and it will bind to the plastic of a syringe that we, we send home. And that's why we typically uh, don't send home rectal Valium um, from the injectable uh, standpoint. So we're usually trying to send home um, either a diastat gel suppository, relatively expensive. Um, there are some uh, compounding pharmacies that will we'll put one together. Under the awesome. So the, the handout is there under the, the handouts. Um, it's the status epilepticus protocol. It kind of answers some of the, the next questions here of, um, you know, the, 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 the dose of intranasal midazolam, the dose of um, doses of medications. Um, do I agree that dogs presenting with stroke may recover with mild or no sequelae? If yes, why? Um, so I'll, I'll answer the question. Dogs that I legitimately diagnose with a stroke. So, you know, signalment, history, MRI, and then kind of ancillary tests after that show that there was a, um, either a ischemic or hemorrhagic infarct. Um, yes, those dogs can make a 100% recovery um, to where they go back to being completely normal. So, um, so can dogs with stroke recover with with mild or no sequelae? Absolutely. Um, the the way you've written the question here with you know stroke in question mark uh, or excuse me in in quotations, um, I, I'm reading that as you know, dogs that present and we suspect a stroke. Um, so I, I guess, yes, those dogs can still get better, um, whether they have a stroke or whether they don't have a stroke. You know, sometimes 
Um, we probably um, still do, but d definitely used to see dogs that were called idiopathic vestibular that may have been having strokes. Um, so sh short answer is yes, dogs can recover from strokes um, completely. Sorry? One more question. Um, how to differentiate, differentiate central versus peripheral vestibular disease? Um, I'm not going to answer that one. Um, we, we will do a talk on vestibular disease. There are ones on our, uh, whatever it's called, YouTube channel. Um, and uh, so that's the statement. And Perfect. Uh, hey, Dr. Morales. Um, so any news on CBD oil to control seizures? I thought I was going to make it out of this without without having to uh, <laughs> open that. So um, CBD oil for control of seizures, super duper hot topic. Um, if you Google dog seizures, you're going to be, you know, see things about CBD oil. And, you know, if you're practicing Kind of anywhere in the United States, I'm sure you're getting asked about it um, every single day or every single time a dog comes in with seizures. Um, I used to get kind of the question once or twice a year. Now I get it once or twice a day of can I give CBD oil to my dog with seizures? Um, my current answer is I don't know. Um, in that my approach is people come to me saying, Dr. Wong, you went to school for a long time. You've You've read all these books. Give me the Cliff Notes um, version on what should I do for my pet or for you know my, my my patient that's come to 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 my veterinary clinic. And I, I'm of the approach currently that I don't have enough information for me to say you know does it help? Does it hurt? What's the appropriate dose? What are the potential adverse effects? Um, how will it affect? the other medications that we're giving, et cetera. So there are people smarter than me looking into that, trying to answer those questions, but currently um, there isn't enough information to say safe, efficacious, side effects, <coughs> how it affects other medications, et cetera. Um, but again, people are looking into that. Um, I, I usually follow this up with the caveat of it's not that you know, I'm anti, you know, anything that isn't a pill. Um, it's not that at all. Um, it's not that, uh, well, I, I usually follow it up with, you know, ask me again in, in five years and, you know, it might be something that I have an answer of, nope, I don't use it or, yep, it's part of my arsenal because now I've got, you know, those studies saying, hey, this is this is something that you can be or should be recommending to your patients um, to, to help them. So um, that is my answer for May 21st, 2021. But uh, because this is going to go on the internet forevermore, um, my answer may be different someday. Well, thank you all for your attendance. Thank you. These were fantastic questions. Um, had a, a, a lot of people attending, so I really, really appreciate that. Um, and I hope everyone is staying safe and is having a fantastic day. Um, I appreciate your attention and uh, take care.